welcome to another episode of Late Night Ponderings, my series of mini editorials that covers a wide range of subjects. Except in this case, where I'm back to Life is Strange, because of course I am. Today's subject, a storm of an ending. Fan reactions to the ending of Life is Strange Before the Storm. Warning, spoilers for Life is Strange and Life is Strange Before the Storm. This is not the first time I've talked about Life is Strange, nor is it the first time that I've discussed the ending of the game. I like to think of this piece as not only as a dissection of the ending of the prequel, but a re-examination of my first late night ponderings on the subject. Think of it as sort of a redux, with a better microphone and stronger editing. Anyways, Life is Strange Before the Storm came out, and the third episode concluded with a nice flash forward showing the relationship that develops between Chloe and Rachel. Unfortunately, our friends over at Deck 9 decided to include a gut punch at the end and show Rachel's phone vibrating on the table while a camera flickers off screen. This is mood whiplash that wasn't expected. Despite the fact that the rest of the game used a lot of imagery in its dreamer hallucination sequences to show Rachel's eventual fate. But this isn't a dissection of the symbolism. This time we are talking about the fans and here is where things get interesting. Now, I understand the tonal shift being somewhat jarring, but all things considered, this is Life is Strange. The game's mood whiplash is both famous and infamous, particularly in the final two episodes of the first game. Before the Storm has the honorary title of being an optional prequel. You don't need to play Before the Storm to understand what's going on in Life is Strange. It expands upon Chloe's character and introduces you fully to Rachel Amber. But other than their story, you don't get a whole lot more world building for Arcadia Bay or its inhabitants, except a little piece here and there. This means that if you didn't like Chloe all that much back when she was your partner, you're probably not gonna like her much here. Chloe was a divisive character already, and while it was good that the likes of Ashley Birch, Chloe's voice actor from the first game, was helping them write the story, it does make the story very much about Chloe. So if you didn't care for her in the first game, or found her habits annoying, most of those things are multiplied by 11 in this game. And on top of that, this isn't helped by the fiery, mysterious troublemaker that is Rachel Amber being part of Chloe's life. It is very much Chloe and Rachel's story, which is a good thing and a bad thing, since having this focus on them makes that last scene all the more painful for those who became invested in their story and romance. That said, I am quite perplexed at the people who are upset by the fact that Rachel dies at the end of Before the Storm. Quite frankly, she's a mighty ripe corpse by the time we get to her, so her death was, by all accounts, an inevitable conclusion. Perhaps not in the way they constructed this scene, but considering the game's track record, they were going to show you something. Barrier Gaze only applies in the past tense in this case because she already died back in 2015. This became reanimating the gaze because we are watching the exploits of her and Chloe prior to Max's arrival in Arcadia Bay. The problem of the Barrier Gaze trope in Life is Strange's original ending was tackled when the last episode was released. This made sense for it at the time, but bringing it up here doesn't do all that much since the game takes place in the past. Sure, it addresses the very real problem of this trope, but we already covered it when we found Rachel's body in the original game, and the discussion just repeats itself, which doesn't help the conversation at large progress. I can understand the complications that came from Life is Strange's original ending, because while I gave the game glowing praise in my initial video, I do agree that the ending was rushed and could have easily had more options rather than the binary one that was given. Not to mention the rushed nature of the Save Chloe ending, which is something that really sticks in my craw. Let's not beat around the bush. The Save Chloe ending in the original game was a selfish choice one way or another, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Love makes you selfish, and many people fell in love with Chloe as a character and were willing to do anything for her, including destroying Arcadia Bay. Well, that, or they chose the ending because all your choices get reversed if you pick the Save Arcadia Bay ending. Either way, there needs to be more endings where two queer characters say screw it and leave everything behind, just maybe not with the same body count and lack of effort. I wish there were more options for the original ending, and while I was happy with how the story was wrapped up in the Save Arcadia Bay ending, I found the Save Chloe ending to be incomplete, and I guess, in a way, before the storm is trying to make up for any loose ends that Life is Strange left. Yet, even then, it seems fans aren't pleased. There's some argument about how the choices you make in Before the Storm don't change anything that happens in Life is Strange, which is again, a confounding statement since this is a prequel that was made after the first game. It's not like these choices have an option of being imported to the first game, since, to be frank, Before the Storm was a complete afterthought, and a way to explain Chloe's personality and to introduce us to Rachel Amber before the storm, as it were. 
Deck Nine did well in elaborating on Chloe's personality, and many moments in Before the Storm were better written and better acted than if it was made by Don't Nod. But the biggest problem, and one few people think about when thinking about Before the Storm, is that Deck Nine was essentially handed a story that already ended and was told to make something out of it. This leads to Before the Storm feeling a little bit more hollow than the previous entry. They were told to follow a blueprint, and that's what they did. The ending itself just reiterated things we knew, or things that we parsed together from the previous game. Things like how Chloe became drawn to Rachel, and why they didn't work out in the end. You weren't gonna get a happy ending out of something that was inevitably written out in the stars, or in this case, commissioned by Square Enix to create. It's a prequel that was given very little breathing room, yet its decisions were received well up until the end. My reaction to people hating the ending was a bit of an exaggeration, because, in a way, I do understand it. There's this feeling of incompleteness that Before the Storm has that even the previous game, despite its faults, lacked. There were good parts in Life is Strange Before the Storm. It gave us more to chew on as a fan base. it had an amazing soundtrack, and for the most part, had a better balance of the darkness and light in the lives of our characters. It knew when to be sad and when to pull back, which is something I will praise Deck Nine for as opposed to Don't Nod who didn't seem to grasp the concept of allowing the mood to set fully after something shocking happened. We were given a chance to look deep within Chloe and Rachel's relationship, which is something that I sincerely enjoyed. Yes, we should keep a critical eye on the game's text, but when it comes to the ending, we can't fight fate. That's reserved for the original game and its final decision. I'm Red Angel, and I'll see you next time.